if there are two questions that are in the back of all farmers' minds, including your farm manager, who I had the privilege to spend the day with the other day, Richard Brook. Um, they are, how do I adjust my farming system to reach the target of net zero emissions by 2040 and preferably much sooner? And critically, can I make that farming system economically viable? Because I think I can say that having tried more or less to adopt some of the principles which I think will move towards net zero emissions, the practice of the principles of the circular economy, minimizing my use of non-renewable damaging inputs, uh, adopting a crop rotation to build soil fertility, using grass-fed ruminants where appropriate to build the soil, the soil carbon, having a nutrient cycle uh, which tries to minimize pollution, energy plan, relocalization and marketing, adding value to the food. I can say that I've needed a day job for the 46 years that I've been farming <laughs> to make that system viable. So if some at least of those ingredients of sustainable agriculture, which we are going to discuss throughout today, uh, are going to be part of the solution, then we have to find a way to change the economic and policy signals that we're all subjected to, uh, to move that sort of system into profit, because otherwise the change simply can't happen and it won't happen. So, on that note, I'm going to introduce the first of our three keynote speakers. It's my privilege and enormous pleasure to introduce uh, Minette Batters. So look, it's, it's a huge privilege to be here today. Um, I just want to talk you through it. There's so much to say at the moment and just so little time to say it in. So I'm going to try and take you on a little bit of a journey, a little bit of our ambition for net zero and what that can look like. But I want to start with, with my journey, effectively. You know, 15 years ago, when I was just sort of getting actively involved with the NFU as branch chairman, you know, it was all for me about table thumping, you know, representing members. And that has been a journey in itself. And we represent 47,000 farming and growing businesses across England and Wales. And so you can imagine they all, sector by sector, uh, and indeed within that sector, they want very different things out of the NFU. And it's very easy to become a bit of a, a ranter and, as I say, a table thumper on what is wanted. I had an email very late last night saying, you know, lamb prices right down, beef prices down to thrifting. What are you going to do about it? And, uh, and that, that happens a lot. But this is different times. And we absolutely, and one of the things that I and my office all the team, Guy Smith and, and Stuart Roberts, are determined to do is to pitch farmers as part of the solution and to be less reactive and more proactive. And we're incredibly lucky within the NFU to be employing around 300 technical experts who work with us in our headquarters in Stoneley, in London, in the regions, in the counties, totally committed to the future of British agriculture. But what have I learned? I think I've learned that as a leader, you have to listen. You have to build consensus. You have to bring people with you. And I absolutely recognize that above all else, climate change is the challenge of our time. And I'm delighted to be here with Gail and Martin today, and particularly with Gail, who in the past, I think the first time she and I would have met would be on the Today program, having never met each other, Gail on one side, me on the other, with the media driving a coach and horses between us before we'd even started. And that's really why I feel today is, is so hugely important. But we can't underestimate the fact that you know, although climate change is, is here and is pressing for each and every one of us, um, we have massive challenges with everything else that is going on. We have an audience that does not buy into this ambition, whether it's climate change deniers. We have other pressing issues right now, uh, Tory leadership being one of them, who is going to be our future prime minister. I, wanna, I could bring out any of these areas. I just want to focus on, on a few. And I want to start off by just mentioning the whole piece around standards. You will have heard me say time and time again, you know, put it in writing. We've had so many conversations around we will not import food 
to lower standards. What does that mean? And it's so much more than food safety. This is about the values of our production. This is about animal welfare and environmental protection. I'm really pleased that Michael Gove, Secretary of State at DEFRA, has agreed to pull a commission together to look at what we would want in future free trade agreements. That work, that team of people has been pulled together. It needs to be a team of experts. I did say to him, you know, Secretary of State, this needs to be chaired by a technical expert, not a politician or a celebrity, to which he smiled, as he does. Um, I, I, you know, life-changing change Ch with trade, with labour, with agricultural policy. And I, I can't stand in front of you today without mentioning the situation on a future workforce and labour requirements. 80,000 seasonal workers we have had willingly coming to the UK. The UK has been the preferred destination, the most desired country to come to. And we know that no deal or deal, free movement ends under the current Prime Minister. It doesn't just stop uh, at seasonal labour. Our permanent workforce is incredibly reliant on uh, a European workforce that have delighted in coming here, 95% of our meat official veterinarians are currently coming from Europe. I'm not saying it can't change, but you know the length of time it takes to train to be a vet. Uh, and these are really, really pressing issues. For many sectors, the horticultural sector, labour is the most pressing issue. What happens with our relationship with Europe? Keeping no deal on the table is the greatest threat, I believe, to us delivering net zero right now. It will set us back for decades if we walk out uh, without a deal. And primarily because if we do do that, we can do nothing on the standards piece. We will be allowing ingredients into our country that would be illegal for our farmers to produce to here. That's why I put the chlorinated chicken one up there, because it is effectively a sort of red herring, really. It's not about the chlorination of chicken. It's scientifically safe to, to chlorinate chicken. It's about the values that sit behind it. And if we take laying hen welfare as an example, the US has no legislation in place on laying hen welfare. And that is why, it's one of the reasons why no deal is catastrophic. But you also go on to three sectors that are ta no tariff protection. So the arable sector could easily have reciprocal tariff protection, nothing in place. Horticulture, no tariff protection in place. Eggs, no tariff protection in place. And anyone who thinks that the tariff war will stay there for any uh, length of time at all is, is removed from reality. We cannot, we cannot allow it to happen. And I urge all of you over the summer months to really, really make that case. So I just feel it's important that we acknowledge our ambition is not taken in isolation. And the game changer for me, and I, I think it's a very clever parting shot by Theresa May to lay the legislation pathway for delivering net zero by 2050. Nobody is going to be able to exclude themselves from that responsibility. And I think in time, it will probably be what she is remembered for most. Climate friendly food is a public good. I don't know whether Dieter Helm is here yet uh, or not. Um, in some ways, I'm hoping that he's not here yet because he and I have had many discussions around is food a public good? Um, and of course it's not, it's a market good. But without doubt, climate-friendly food production is a public good. Now one of the things that I really wanted to do when I knew, having lobbied, the NFU has lobbied DEFRA for many years now to introduce a food strategy, and finally we have it on the table, and I'm absolutely delighted that Henry Dimbleby is leading for the first time in 75 years on a new food strategy that we really would work with government on what was needed. So we brought together, rather than react, our own food strategy last year. This couldn't be an NFU strategy. This had to be about working with wider stakeholders, bringing everybody around the table to discuss really four pillars, four themes of thinking. So the first being integrity and standards and zero tolerance on food fraud. So very much focusing on the success of our farm assurance schemes, the fact that from farm to fork we have complete assurance. I think we tend to forget what a success story that has been. And 20 years ago, our industry was on its knees. Its reputation in the eyes of the public was absolutely damned. We had foot and mouth, we had BSE, we had salmonella. If you wanted to lose your job as a minister, you had the responsibility of food and agriculture. 
The second point that we wanted to focus on, and this is a new one really for farmers to get involved in, was health and nutrition. And I think this, to me, is, is a big pillar of the thinking of delivering on net zero. Making the link between our raw ingredients, our whole foods. There are no bad whole foods. There are only bad diets. The third one was the moral imperative. You know, we hear many conversations, and indeed I get challenged a lot by the varied membership that we have, um, many of whom delight in being park keepers. And I would say, and put it on record, that is absolutely fine. We are farming in many different ways, in many different systems. But we absolutely, here in Northern Europe, should be producing food. We have a fantastic climate that other parts of the world don't have. We have 72% of the UK is a farmed, a farmed landscape, a man-made landscape. We have 60% of the country that grows grass. I came back from Wales yesterday, and if you want your mind focused on the fact that we grow grass and we have a lot of sheep, go and drive through Wales. Because I drove all the way here, pretty much nearly two hours, and I saw a lot of sheep, and I saw a lot of grass, and I saw a lot of the most stunning countryside you could ever wish to see, interwoven small fields, hedges, trees, but you couldn't do much else there. A lot of it is very undulating, sometimes seriously undulating. And I was looking field by field almost at what else could be done here. Primarily, those are phenomenal carbon sinks that are managed and grazed by our outstanding livestock system. <laughs> And the, the final point is in the, the food uh, strategy thinking is agriculture's relationship with nature. Um, now, that is obviously incredibly broad, but I again feel you need an anchor. Yes, you know, we want to do so much more for biodiversity. We want to do so much more for the environment, but you need an anchor spot. And I do believe that actually getting our ambition on climate change right and holding that as the baseline will deliver on biodiversity, environmental outcomes, and also focus on food production, climate-friendly food production, sitting at the heart of this new thinking. This now uh, just sort of takes you on to you know, where we are and what we think uh, it looks like. And you know, agriculture is absolutely unique, and I think we tend to forget this point, because we are both a sink and a source. And that means, unlike other industries, that we have a solution within our grasp. And of course, agriculture is about 10% uh, of greenhouse gas emissions. But again, there is a stark difference with only 10% uh, being CO2 and, of course, 40% nitrous oxide and 50% methane. So you see effectively what is, I would say, uh, a three-pillar matrix. Um, and this will be iterative. And I can't, I can't underestimate how important it will be to, to get the science, uh, technology, uh, and innovation uh, at the heart of, of what we're trying to achieve. You know, we look at uh, investing in productivity and what is needed on efficiencies. We have the Livestock Information Programme going live this autumn. That will be able to drive a revolutionary approach with our livestock system. So instead, in the past, when we had coupled support that was just going into, effectively, headage payments, we've absolutely got to be able to reward genetic profile, health status, uh, welfare outcomes, all that will drive a far healthier, uh, less impacting livestock sector. I really believe, and I know our Crops Board Chairman, Tom Bradshaw, really believes, and indeed Ali Kappa, who takes up hort and sugar, with Michael Sly, we really believe we've got to look at the cropping sector, at transparency, really take leadership from what Rumour has done with responsible use in edible medicines, and really be able to talk about actually what we are using, uh, making sure that it is responsibly used, and wherever we can, be looking at the science and the technology that helps us produce more but impact less at all times. Um, it's rare that the cropping sector learns from the livestock sector, but I think this time... That is going to happen. And the other thing to say is, you know, ELMS is, is sort of on the table as a policy discussion at the moment with the testing trials. We really want to have a net zero pilot, working with all the stakeholders in the room to look at what is needed for the future. I was down at Yo Valley the other day looking at their phenomenal 
uh, business. So they are the largest own brand uh, yogurt. Uh, standing in front of Mary Crick, I'm slightly nervous saying this, that she'll, she'll challenge me. But they are the largest own label yogurt brand in the country. It's been a phenomenal success. They're in all the major retailers. And they put forward a proposal uh, from biomass to biochar delivering on 0.4% of carbon per annum. If we could bring all of these things in to trial a pilot, we can really look at the evidence base for what is needed going forwards. I just want to mention my farm and what the future holds. We run a wedding business. I'm a tenant farmer in South Wiltshire. I'm enormously fortunate to be employing uh, Richard Brooke, who used to work for Rothamsted and was farm manager at the Northwick Grassland Research Centre. Um, and being not on the farm uh, for five days of the week, I, I feel I can take no credit uh, for anything there. I think Richard would refer to it that I sort of ice the cake. I don't think I even ice the cake. I might put the odd candle on occasionally. Um, but we have a wedding business. We have weddings from uh, March through until Christmas every uh, weekend. Um, we very much build in the farming story to the weddings. But what has stretched my thinking is we have weddings. Weddings are now completely national. We have people coming from all over the country, bringing their friends from all over the country. And from next year, I want every single wedding to be planting a tree and really taking ownership of the challenges that we face, the challenge that their wedding actually puts onto the environment and take ownership that every single one of us has to have ownership of this problem. This can't just be about farmers and food producers. Every one of us has ownership. So that's what we'll be doing. You know, I started farming uh, 25 years ago with just 15 suckler cows. Um, we have a very, very different business now. We have 100 uh, continental cross uh, cows. We have a small herd of pedigree Herefords and just started uh, a small herd of pedigree Angus. Uh, the picture at the bottom is an autumn calf that will be weaned uh, in about a month's time. It's extraordinary to me, our autumn calves always do. They're always 50 uh, kilos better than the spring calves when we, when we wean them. Uh, so all calves will be pretty much 400 kilos uh, when we wean them. This is an absolutely historic meadow, as we have many of uh, throughout uh, England and Wales. Um, it's never been touched. It's never had any inputs on it. I'm always amazed at how well our cattle do on it. It has no footpaths. It has no access. And so it is a complete uh, wilderness and an absolute haven. And what fascinated me with the BioBlitz that we did was finding all the other things that on my farm I had never looked for. And that is what I found shocking to myself. We were home to 40 moths down there, and I didn't know there were 40 moths. I thought there were probably somewhere between five and 10 different moth species. So it's all about, I think, empowering people to look further, uh, expand our thinking of what's needed. And I would just say there are five priorities, I guess, for my farm, many of which we're delivering on already. But without doubt, benchmarking uh, livestock performance is going to be critical to the future. We've got to be chasing. We've got to be bringing the bottom 25% up. We've got to be focusing on all wanting to be in the top 25%. We've got to be improving on our cattle health. Um, I am really pleased. We have a fantastic vet in my part of the world. We have driven out BVD completely. Farmers absolutely get the challenges of endemic disease. The threat to my business is TB, but focusing on improving cattle health is essential. Feed additives. You know, diet is changing by the minute. Again, the new technologies for what is coming on the market is going to massively help with our emissions. Enhancing our hedgerows. You know, I, I absolutely know that this can be a big part. Yes, it's about planting trees, but we already have a phenomenal um, hedge patchwork throughout the country. We could do more. We could enhance them. And, and finally, managing our grassland. And if we do nothing else, focusing on soil fertility and restoring carbon has to be at the basis of all of this. So it's a whirlwind trip through. There is never long enough. I would just leave with a final conclusion. We look like we will have COP26 next year. Now, that is a phenomenal chance for our industry, for agriculture, to say, above all other industries, we are out there. We understand that this is the most compelling and challenging moment that we will face in our lifetimes. And we are going to play our part, and we are going to be the solution in all of this. This today is the start of what I think is a phenomenally positive conversation. 
I'm delighted to be here and I look forward to taking questions later. Thank you very much.